morning, brothers and sisters. We'd like to welcome you to our uh, annual state conference. It seems like we were just doing this a few months ago. If you think about what's changed, um, we can see most of your faces today, so we're excited about that. Um, you might not be as excited looking this direction, but uh, we're grateful that we're all here and uh, able to meet as compactly as we are, and we appreciate you coming. And we also are grateful for those who are watching uh, online today. Uh, we hope that it will be a spiritual meeting uh, for everyone that's here. We would like to welcome um, a few people. We're grateful to have President uh, Jerry and Sister Kit Jensen with us from the Temple Presidency. I know some of you that work in the Temple uh, are familiar with them, but we're, we're grateful that they're with us today. We're also grateful to have uh, Patriarch Hansen and Patriarch Hamblin here today and, and appreciate the spiritual strength. Um, that they bring into our stake and into so many of your individual lives. This is gonna put us off schedule. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Ken. He's already, he was already going through the timing and he's like, if you're weepy, it's gonna put us off schedule. So I'm sorry. Um, we're grateful to have the single adult uh, the elders quorum from the single adult ward who are serving as ushers and help set up the chairs. Um, that ward is a strength for our stake and we're grateful to have so many other members here with us today and want them to know of the love and appreciation that we have for them. I think this has to do with being up all night trying to come up with a talk. I'm so sorry. Um, we'll open today by singing on page 134, I Believe in Christ, following which uh, Brother Justin Peterson, a good young man from the Riverdale Fourth Ward, will give us our invocation. Uh, he will be followed by President Woodbury, who will take care of some stake business. We'll go to that point.
Our dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day and we're thankful for all of our many blessings and all that you sacrificed for us and we're thankful for our dear prophet and we know that his words are from me and please bless so we can get home safely and learn all that we can today and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Thank you, Brother Peterson. Um, we would, um, for whatever reason, they've been working on the chapel and uh, as luck would have it, it appears as though we the raising this last night for Brother um, Mark has made it so it doesn't work today, so <laughs> you're you already having an effect from your talk last night. Thank you. Um, well, President Woodbury has some stake business. Following the stake business, we'll have a musical number from our stake women's choir, and we appreciate Brother Simone and Sister Marianne Christiansen providing the music and the direction for that choir. Following the choir, uh, we'll hear from Sister Taisy Harrop of the Riverdale Second Ward. She'll be followed by Kyan Workman and Carson Workman, who are uh, twin brothers, both working on their missionary applications from the Riverdale First Ward. Um, I've got to be honest, this is the part that scares me, having the two of them up here. But uh, they're great young men, as you'll see, and we're, we're grateful that they're willing to share their testimonies with, with us today. Uh, they will be followed by Sister Erin Bardwell, who recently returned from her mission, and she will be followed by Brother Raphael Asnar, who's a member of the bishopric. in the Jefferson Third Award. And just a great man. We're grateful for his willingness to speak today in English or in Spanish. I, I probably just scared him to death. Um, <laughs> we're grateful for his willingness to speak in Spanish and to have um, Bishop Ramos as his translator into English. And so uh, we're, we appreciate that. Following Brother Asnar, we've asked Sister uh, Emery James, one of our full-time sister missionaries who serves in the Spanish ward, to share her testimony with us. She's nearing the end of her mission and is um, one of the rock star sisters in the mission, and we're, we're grateful for her service, and uh, we look forward to her testimony. Uh, we'll go to that point. Good, happy morning, everyone. It is a blessing to gather together. And this time we have some stake business. We would propose that the following be sustained in their advancement of the, pre, uh, um, the priesthood and receiving the Melchizedek priesthood. If they are in the audience, will you please stand? To receive the Melchizedek priesthood and be ordained to the office of an elder, Brother Chris Bradshaw of the Riverdale Fourth Ward, and Brother Isaac Staten of the Riverdale Seventh Ward. Those in favor, please manifest it by the uplifted hand. And those opposed, if any, by the same sign. Thank you. We've also extended the following release to be effective July 1st, 2022. Brother Ken Reed, a stake executive secretary. We wish to recognize Ken for his 23 years of devoted service to the members of this stake, to five different stake presidents. It's going to take us some time to adjust to this change, thus the effective date of July 1st. <laughs> <laughs> All who wish to join us in expressing appreciation to Brother Ken Reed for his devoted service, please manifest it. We look forward to hearing from Brother Ken Reed and his devoted wife, Julie, later in the program.
Good morning, everybody. My name is Tacey Harrop. I am from the Riverdale Second Ward. This is my first official talk, and it's in front of the whole Riverdale Stakes, so I might as well go big or go home. And home sounds pretty good right now. <laughs> um, I'll quickly introduce myself. I'm the youngest of five siblings. I have two amazing parents and the cutest dog in the world. My family means everything to me, and I don't know what I would do without them. I love music, and especially dance. Um, I have taken ballet lessons for 10 years, and this year I have been on my school's cheerleading team at T.H. Bell Junior High School. At Bell, this is also my first year in seminary, and I absolutely love it. My brother, or brother Woody, is my seminary teacher, and he is the best. It is my favorite class of the day, and it has helped me feel closer to Heavenly Father and gain a stronger testimony of Jesus Christ. I was asked to speak today on how I keep my spiritual momentum in my life and what brings me spiritual strength. To begin, what does momentum mean? To me, momentum means to get something moving in a particular direction. That does not always mean something is moving in the positive direction. You could be moving towards a goal or away from a goal. I had a recent experience with momentum a week ago when I was um, on the University of Utah's campus for my sister's graduation. My family was there, including my grandmother, Nancy, who, is, um, who I was in charge of pushing um, in her wheelchair. When we approached a decline, I had to be very careful to control my grandmother in the wheelchair to make sure she did not get away from me. If my grandmother went down rolling, rolling down the hill, that would have been bad. Um, I did not want my grandmother or the wheelchair to gain momentum beyond my control. On that same day, we were on a flat stretch of sidewalk before climbing up a steep hill. It occurred to me that if I got some momentum at the bottom of the hill, that would help me climb to the top. In the end, we got a running start and we reached our goal. We had made it to the top of the hill. I have reflected on this example and how it might apply to the gospel and our lives. In this example, I was able to gain momentum in the flat stretch of sidewalk in order to carry us through the tougher challenges of the incline. By going to church every week, attending seminary, having daily prayer and scripture study are like the flat parts of the sidewalk. In these times and actions where we build is where we build momentum. In President Nelson's talk about spiritual momentum, he states, we have never needed positive spiritual momentum more than we do now. To counteract the speed with which evil and the darker signs of the times are intensifying, positive spiritual momentum will keep us moving forward amid the fear and certainty created by pandemics, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions, and armed hostilities. Spiritual movement will help us withstand the relentless wicked attacks of the adversary and thwart his efforts to erode our personal spiritual foundation. I know that I can always strengthen my spiritual momentum by praying, doing my scripture study, serving other, others, and attending church activities and seminary. I have another example of where our family uses momentum. We live at the top of a high cul-de-sac where the driveway is really steep. 
On snowy and wintry days, we have to build momentum at the bottom of the hill in order to make up the road and the driveway. Otherwise, we have to slide back to the bottom of the hill and start all over again. We have discovered that if we get enough traction, it will help us gain momentum. It's probably funny to our neighbors who watch us constantly struggling to get up the hill in the winter times. Momentum does not always go in the right direction. Like my grandmother rolling, <laughs> rolling down the hill or the car is sliding down the hill backwards, sometimes momentum can take us away from our goals. We must be aware of creating momentum that speeds us away from the gospel and salvation. Some may think that having zero momentum is okay since we are not going backwards, but I know from riding my bike that when I have zero momentum, I lose my balance and I fall over. So we must always remember that positive spiritual momentum is the best momentum. I would like to bear my testimony that I know this is the true church. I am grateful for Jesus Christ and for the atonement. I love the Book of Mormon and I know it is the word of God. I am grateful for temples and for the spiritual experiences I have had there doing baptisms for the dead. I am grateful for my seminary class, young women's, and for all the great activities and ex spiritual experiences I've had. I know that we can all gain positive spiritual momentum to take us where we need to be. I know President Russell M. Nelson is our prophet, and I am grateful for his talk on spiritual momentum. I have learned a lot from studying it. Have a momentous day. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hi, guys. Um, I'm not good at this stuff, so bear with me, okay? Okay, so in the pastoral conference, President Nelson stated, we have never needed positive spiritual mo momentum more than we do now to, to counteract the speed with which evil and the darker signs of the times are intensifying. Positive spiritual momentum will keep us moving forward amid the, amid the fear and uncertainty created by pandemics, tsunamis, volcanic volcanic eruptions, and armed hostil hostilities. Uh, spiritual mo momentum can help us withstand the relentless wicked attacks of the adversary and throughout his efforts to erode our personal spiritual foundation. Uh, let me tell you a story um, about how positive and negative spiritual momentum has impacted me in my life so far. At a young age, my parents told me that a mission was one of the, one of the greatest things they've ever done before, and they strongly encouraged me and my brothers um, that we should go have, have an experience of our own. Um, on that day, I made a promise to myself that I was going to go on a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, it, was as if, it was as if a flame sprouted, like a seed of a flower sprouts and makes something beautiful. My, my personal spiritual found, foundation began to um, grow. Um, it continued to grow as I grew older and bound myself to that promise of serving a mission. I was so excited and I, and I could feel the positive and spiritual momentum as I continued to hear many more experiences from other people about their own missions. I can understand, I can understand what President Nielsen means by having this positive momentum helping us counteract the speed and, and, and power of evil during these latter days. When I would hear these experiences from my family, my friends, church leaders, current missionaries, that flame began to grow and grow, and it was like nothing could blow it out. I want, I want to move forward with, this, with great and positive momentum. President, also, President Nielsen also made mention that there were that, that there would be many that there would be relentless and wicked attacks of Satan. My family and I recently moved into the stake about uh, a year and a half ago. In our old ward, my brothers and I were usually the only three young men who um, seemed to uh, um, who, who who were really asked to do anything, um, and I felt as if that flame I had was slowly being smothered. There seemed to be one question that, that kept coming to me, to my mind, as I grew older, and that question was, is a mission right for me? Um, it, it was a question that came to me many times um, in that year before we moved into the stake and ward. I never told anybody about this, as I felt I should keep this one bit of question to myself. When, when we decided to move, I was excited to meet new people, make more friends, and have new experiences, but I, also, I was also a little fearful. And it was um, nerve-wracking because moving also meant I had a new ward, a new neighborhood, and I didn't know what kind of new people I would get to know. Uh, but, but, but when we got here, my fears were, were almost gone instantly. And moving, um, and, and moving into the stake and ward was actually one of the best things f for my testimony. Um, to relight the flame and to bring it back to its former glory. Um, it took a few times 
of coming to church in this ward to get a feel for the ward and to understand how much I, lo- I love, how I love, how much, how much love I have for the Riverdale First Ward. Bishop Tyker, my current bishop, is one of the is one of the is one of the two people in the state who have changed my life. He is the first bishop who seemed to understand me, and he's the type of bishop that you can talk to about anything. And um, he's the bishop I've needed for a while. Um, um, a current missionary, Elder Jackson, um, is the second person who changed my life, and he's a great guy. Um, these two people have shown me what it is like to feel the Spirit and understand the gospel in a completely different way than, than I used to. Because of this, I want to help others feel the Spirit and have the same understanding. The same understanding. It is because of their friendship and them sharing their own personal experience about preparing and serving a mission, and it, it made me feel that that flame and that burning desire that I, that I had once before. Overcoming my own personal attack on my testimony and the importance of serving a mission has led, to me, has, has, led, has led to me to this point where I am actively preparing to serve a mission. As I have prepared to, f- for my mission, as I have prepared f- for my mission these past couple of months, I have felt a great desire to go and serve the Lord. But at the same time, I have had the same question that I, that I had before. Is a mission the right thing for me? And it pops in my head from time to time. Um, and it doesn't get easier, not until you're doing the Lord's work. But even then, it's going to be a great challenge, and it is still going to be very hard because Satan never stops. He wants us to fail. If you are planning on going on a mission in the future, I implore you to prepare daily and to set a goal to go now. So when the time actually arrives for you to go, it will be easier to... It will be easier to fight Satan because you will have a strong foundation and a sure goal. I like to bear my testimony um, that from all the experiences that I have heard and the excitement that I feel and see whenever I hear mission story, a mission story, that a mission is the right thing for me at this point in time in my life. I know that Heavenly Father is our Father and that He loves us and He wants the best for us. I know that Jesus lives and through His atonement we can repent and return to our Father in Heaven. I know that the Holy Ghost speaks to us in a whisper. But those whispers can be profound and will lead us to eternal happiness. I love this stake, and it has changed, and it has changed me forever. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Um, good morning, guys. Um, sorry if I mumble a little bit. I got my wisdom teeth out this week, so it kind of hurts and stuff. So. I just want to apologize for that. Um, President Nelson, in this past general conference, stated, My dear brothers and sisters, with all the pleadings in my heart, I urge you to get on the covenant path and stay there. Experience the joy of repenting daily. Learn about God and how he works. Seek and expect miracles. Strive to end conflict in your life. As you act on these pursuits, I promise you the ability to move forward on the covenant path with increased momentum despite whatever obstacles you face. And I promise you greater strength to resist temptation, more peace of mind, and freedom of fear, and greater unity in your families. Today, temptation is rampant. Teenagers and even younger children are faced with so much negativity, temptations, and peer pressure that it is much easier to just do what everyone else is doing and fall off the path. Today's access to drugs and sexual promiscuity has created a cesspool of sin that teens just seem to dive right into. Um, leaving many of them thinking that they can just repent later. This is what Satan wants. Le- um, wants us to believe because then he has us right where he wants us. Miserable like unto him. Satan wants us off the covenant path. President Nelson has provided us with counsel as to what can keep us spiritually motivated and moving forward. One of the things he specifically mentioned was that we should seek and expect miracles. In my experience, many people think of miracles as only happening in the olden days, but I experience miracles almost every day, and I believe many of us do, but just don't notice it. In President Nelson's talk, he said, Moroni assured us that God has not ceased to be a God of miracles. Every book of scripture demonstrates how willing the Lord is to intervene in the lives of those who believe in him. He told us that if we do the spiritual work, we can seek miracles. We do need to prayerfully ask for God's help to exercise that kind of faith. By doing this, um, by doing this, 
we, it will help us move forward and increase our spiritual momentum. Because we are expecting miracles, we will have the ability to withstand all the temptations that surround us today. And as Satan is wanting, and as Satan is wanting to attack the righteous, of the youth and prevent them from doing things like serving missions, these promised miracles are needed more than ever. President Nelson has said, few things will accelerate your spiritual momentum more than realizing that the Lord is willing to help you to move a mountain in your life. In, um, with high school coming to an end now and me growing up a bit and me preparing for a mission, I can see how important it is to have positive spiritual momentum in my life. There have been many times where my friends may have wanted me to do something I shouldn't, and the peer pressure has been difficult. But remembering the teachings of my leaders and my family have helped my spiritual momentum increase. They have helped protect me from falling into the, that peer pressure. This has helped me greatly in my preparation for my mission by eliminating so many temptations that have appeared in my life. So many things and people have encouraged me to go on a mission, such as my parents' guiding hands in my life and my friends who have either already received their mission calls or are preparing to do so. More than ever in my life have I felt the need for positive spiritual momentum as I have right now in preparing for my mission. Satan does not want us youth going on missions to spread the gospel. He wants to tear us down and prevent us from advancing God's work on this earth. Satan knows that God is a God of miracles, and he wants us to forget that. We are so blessed to have a living prophet who reminds us that we can expect miracles and that we can know without a doubt that God lives and loves us. We can absolutely do great things if we put the spiritual work that is needed in order to receive those miracles. As we do God's work and come closer to him, we should also expect miracles because they will come. This, is undoubtedly, this will undo, undoubtedly increase our spiritual momentum, which will help us combat Satan during these latter days. Remember that we have been promised with greater strength to resist temptation, more peace of mind, freedom from fear, and greater unity in our families. If we move forward each and every day trying to do our very best. Um, brothers and sisters, I have a knowledge of this um, the truthfulness of this gospel in this church. I know it's God's, um, his true church on this earth, and I know that God and Jesus love us, and they want nothing more for us than the best and to, for us to um, repent and get back to him. And I say this in his name, Jesus Christ, amen. amen. I told both of the workman boys that if they cried a little bit in between what they were saying, then I wouldn't have to speak as long. And so I really enjoyed their talks, though, <laughs> and I'm happy to be here, brothers and sisters. Um, for those that don't know me, um, my name is Erin, um, and I'm also from the Riverdale First Ward, um, and I also love our faithful bishop, uh, Bishop Tykert. I don't know where he's sitting, um, but just know that I love you wherever you're sitting. <laughs> um, can I just say before I start, I love this steak and I was so humbled to sit up here and listen as I'm um, a congregation of this size saying the words I believe in Christ that's a powerful statement brothers and sisters and it's powerful when it's um, sung with purpose and with the presence of the spirit and in, um, in a congregation this size um, you know the beautiful thing about getting to speak in state conference is that you know that it's going to be on a topic that the Lord needed you to study. <laughs> um, and I know that was the case for me um, when President Woodbury called. I s looked at my parents and I said, is it okay if you call them and deny an assignment and tell them you're going to be sick and you, know, you can't do it? When in reality, I, before having to study for this, I didn't realize what spiritual momentum meant in my life right now. Um, just as President Jensen said, I returned home from my mission about two months ago. Um, I served in the New Zealand Wellington mission, the best mission um, of all the missions, and I don't want to argue about that afterwards. <laughs> um, and I felt a lot more comfortable as I watched um, these faithful elders and sisters walk onto the stand. Um, I wish I was still sitting over there. But I know that that doesn't mean I can't do missionary work, just because I don't have a badge on anymore. Um, 
So for anyone that knows me already, um, you know that my family and I have a special connection to New Zealand. Um, my mom's from New Zealand and all of her family are there. And so when I received my mission call to go there, I, I knew how aware the Lord was of me and of my family and of my heart um, and how inspired that assignment was. Um, one of the blessings about serving there was that I was around my family. Um, not just my, my family because we're all God's children, but because my family is there. Um, and in my third area, a place called Rangiora, I was serving with my great uncle and my auntie and um, my second cousin. And my second cousin is not a member of the church. And um, considering that we grew up here, we didn't get to spend much time with them. And um, so it was a blessing that I got to go and spend some time with them. Um, and my cousin's name is Nikita. And Nikita is a beautiful girl. She's very soft-spoken. She doesn't speak up very much. And um, my uncle was the elders quorum president. And so the missionaries were in their home frequently. Um, but she never felt the desire to listen to them or to participate when they asked her questions. Um, we sat down at the dinner table one day, and as missionaries do, we wanted to share a message. And we sat and we shared a message with her, and she had all these questions all of a sudden. Um, so we left her with the Book of Mormon that day. We gave her specific scriptures to read. It was actually something that we had discussed and something that reminded me of these youth that have just spoken before me. I'm in Alma chapter 57 about the Ammonite stripling warriors where it says, Now this was the faith of these of whom I have spoken. They are young and their minds are firm and they do put their trust in God continually. And I think this applies very well to momentum. Um, Nikita wasn't necessarily sitting and not moving at all, um, but her momentum wasn't steady. Um, and it didn't need to be fast. I think that's one thing I've learned, especially about momentum, is that it doesn't matter what speed the momentum is. That's a beautiful thing about the gospel, is that the Lord doesn't care how fast we go, how far ahead we go. He doesn't even care if sometimes we have to stop and ask for directions, because we all need them. Um, but as we sat down with Nikita, and as we talked about this faith, her faith began to grow. Um, we sat down with her um, just a lesson after this experience, and she looked at us after having read the Book of Mormon and said, Sisters, why, why did they kill the Savior? Why did he hang on a cross? Did he do something wrong? Why did they do that to him? Now, I'm sure that if I asked each of you this question, you could probably tell me what that question means, what the answer for that question means to you. But Nikita didn't know. And I think sometimes as members of the church, we neglect to remember that, that we have these precious truths of the gospel that give us momentum, that give us motivation, that give us strength, and we, we forget them sometimes. We forget to cherish them. We forget to share them and live as though we know those things. Um, I was humbled as um, Sister Hansen got up yesterday and talked about the miracle that is miracles. I think we just expect miracles to come according to our faith, but brothers and sisters, there's nothing stopping us from praying for miracles. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and just like Brother Workman said, there are miracles every day, all the time. Um, and I've gained a greater knowledge of that just since I've been home from my mission. Um, not to scare you, others and sisters, but no one really prepares you for coming home from a mission. It's hard. <laughs> um, and that's how you know that the church is true. And that the atonement works is because it's hard. And the beautiful thing about it is we know how the end of the story goes. We know who wins in the end. And so, brothers and sisters, if you get nothing else from me standing up here <laughs> sharing my testimony today, I pray that you'll remember that the Lord does not care what speed you are going at. but he does expect you to try. <clears throat> and he doesn't expect you to do it, do it alone. 
One beautiful thing that's always stood out to me about the temple is that when we, when we go, we don't have to remember everything. There's always someone there to help us. I think that's significant to us right now, too. He doesn't expect us to go at it alone. And he doesn't, he doesn't care how fast we get there. He just wants us to come home to him, all of us. Um, and the beautiful thing is we don't have to stay where we are right now. That's the purpose of our prophet speaking about spirit, spiritual momentum. I love that that's the theme here. That as long as we're moving toward the Savior, that is enough. That's enough for him. Um, another thing kind of struck me about what we spoke about yesterday um, in this session. Um, President Woodbury got up and talked about how Christianity is not a comfortable concept. If Christianity was really comfortable, the missionaries wouldn't be here right now. The elders would be sitting in the font day and night, getting pneumonia, because they don't leave. <laughs> okay. Christianity is not a comfortable thing. It's not meant to be comfortable. That's why it's hard. It's because there's no growth when we're comfortable. We have to move to discomfort. We have to stay in discomfort in order to continue to grow. Um, it's kind of like growing pains when you have kids that get sore knees because they are growing. It's not a comfortable thing, but it's important, and it's, they need to grow. Um, and so I think spiritual momentum for me, especially now, means that I need to show the Lord that I learned something on my mission, that I grew on my mission, that I did experience those spiritual growing pains. And I know that there are many of you sitting here now um, that are experiencing those same things. I think of um, Elder Christopherson in his talk, and he said, you know, what a blessing that the Lord sees that we're worth the trouble to help and to correct. Um, and so, um, my invitation to you today, brothers and sisters, is to not focus on the speed, not focus on how many times you have to stop and ask for directions, but to do it when you need to. I think one of the greatest things I learned on my mission is that I can counsel, not just ask, but I can counsel with the Lord. He knows my heart. He knows the good that we try to do. And that's more than enough for him. He just wants us to try. Um, there's a scripture that I just wanted to share. Um, it's from Job. Um, he says, But he knoweth the way that I take, and he hath tried me. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Positive spiritual momentum is possible because the Savior is real and because he loves us. And I know that he loves us. I can feel that love. And I pray that you will continue to pray for the opportunity to feel that love for those that you serve. Brothers and sisters, you are worth the life of the Savior. He knows you and he loves you. So please trust him. We can all learn how to trust him. I'm still learning to. I love each of you. I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for the Savior. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Morning, uh, brother and, sis and sister. Buenos días, hermanos y hermanas. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> my 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 English no is very good and uh, speaking uh, Spanish. <laughs> um, my um, my name is Rafael Aznar. Oh, my my nombre is Rafael Aznar. My name is Rafael Astar. <laughs> yeah. 
Eh, le doy gracias al presidente Jason por darme esta posibilidad de mm, dar este discurso. Uh, I appreciate president, the presidency for giving me this, this opportunity to speak. Es mi primero. It's my first time. No estoy tan nervioso como en otras ocasiones. In, in a state like this, but I'm not as nervous as I used to be in the past. Porque delante de mí tengo hermanos y hermanos. Be because ejemplar. in front of me, I have brothers and sisters who love me. Y me ayudan a que yo pueda eh, dar mi discurso como debe ser. And this helps me to give this talk like I want to do so. Eh, yo en la conferencia de abril el presidente Nelson habló acerca del impulso o impetu espiritual. In the conference of April, President Nelson spoke about the uh, importance of spiritual momentum. Y nos surgió cinco maneras de mantener un impetu espiritual positivo. And he gave us five different ways to maintain this spiritual momentum. ¿Qué puede generar impetu espiritual positivo? What can generate this uh, momentum? Pues entrar en la senda de los convenios y permanecer en ella. To be on the path, uh, the, the, the covenant path, and stay on it. Descubrir el gozo del arrepentimiento diario. Uh, discover the joy of daily repentance. Aprender acerca de Dios y la forma en la que Él obra. To learn about God and the form in which He works in our lives. Procuren y esperen milagros. And to obtain and seek for miracles. Pongan fin a los conflicto, conflictos en su vida personal. And to uh, end the conflicts in your personal life. Eh, yo quisiera decir que estas cinco maneras que el presidente habla. These five ways that the that the pre, uh, that President Nelson says. Desde que conocí la iglesia en Valencia, España. Since I learned about the church in Valencia, Spain. Yo lo he aplicado en mi vida. I have applied in my life. Me ha ayudado mucho. It has helped me. Mi familia en Cuba, soy de Cuba. My family in Cuba, I was born in Cuba. Están muy contento porque yo haya eh, dado este paso de... Uh, are very happy because I made this step de conocer la iglesia de Jesucristo de los santos de los últimos días and finding this church of Jesus Christ of latter day saints el presidente Nelson prometió que participar en el, participar en las cinco sesiones que describió uh, president Nelson told us that participating in those five steps that he mentioned ayudará a las personas a avanzar por el camino del convenio will help all people uh, continue on the covenant path con un impetu espiritual positivo independientemente de sus desafíos with a uh, spiritual momentum going forward in spite of whatever their uh, challenges are también prometió fuerza para resistir la tentación he also promised uh, strength to resist uh, temptation paz mental uh, obtaining mental peace, la libertad, liberty, mayor unidad familiar, and greater family unity. Entrar en la senda de los convenios, entering into the path of the, and into the covenant path, es un, un convenio es una promesa entre el Padre celestial, celestial y sus hijos. Is a promise and a covenant between God the Father and His children. Los convenios, la La obediencia a los principios del Evangelio se, arri oh. se arra arraiga en nuestra alma misma. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the covenants, the obedience and obedience to these principles of the gospel uh, will reside in our, deep in our souls. En la escritura que está en Abraham 27, 20, 28, el Señor dijo. In Abraham 27, 28, uh, chapter 3, 2728 who will I send y un al hijo del hombre and one similar to the Son of God responded aquí, envíame, y otro contestó, y dijo, here am I send me and another answered 
y dijo, Enme aquí, envíame a mí. Y el Señor dijo, enviaré al primero. And another stood up and said, send me. And God the Father said, I will send the first. Y el segundo se llevó de ira y no guardó su primer estado. And the second one was filled with anger and lost his primary state. Y muchos le siguieron, lo siguieron ese día. And many followed him that day. El arrepentimiento es uno de los principios más consoladores y gloriosos que enseña el Evangelio. A repentance is one of the uh, principles most comforting and glorious that are taught in the gospel. Lo que precisamos dentro de la iglesia, así como fuera de ella, es el arrepentimiento. What we need in the church, as well as out of the church, is this principle of repentance. Necesitamos más fe y más determinación de servir al Señor. We need more faith and more determination to serve the Savior. Recordemos que Satanás se deleita en la desdicha de cada uno de nosotros. Remembering that uh, Satan delights in the sadness and fall of each one of us. Aprender acerca de Dios y la forma en la que él obra podemos conocerlo más. Learning about God and the form in which he works in our lives. Sí. sí. Por medio de la escritura y la oración es maravilloso. Uh, and let's see, works to us through the scriptures and prayer is marvelous. Saber que podemos recurrir a Dios en el, el eterno Padre en humilde oración. Knowing that we can go to our Heavenly Father in humble prayer. Él está allí presente como un Dios. He is there present as a God. Personal y viviente eterno. Personal and living and eternal. Padre en humilde oración. Uh, we can go to him in humble prayer. Él está allí presente. Procurar y esperar mirar. Los milagros se producen mediante el poder divino. Uh, obtaining and waiting for miracles is produced while we, uh, through divine power. De aquel que es poderoso para salvar. From him who is powerful to save. Son extensiones del plan de Dios, plan eterno de Dios. They are extensions of, of the eternal plan of God. Son una ayuda esencial del cielo a la tierra. They are a, an, an essential help from God, from the heavens to the earth. Y abundan entre los seguidores de Cristo hoy en día en la, en la vida de nosotros, de todos nosotros. And are abundant in the lives of those followers of Christ this day and always. Pongan fin a los conflictos en su vida. Yes, uh, and the conflicts in your personal lives. Para esto debemos ejercer la humildad. For that we need to exercise our humility. Del valor y la fortaleza. Uh, courage and strength. La clave está en la conversión. The key is in our personal conversion. A fin de poder recibir la plenitud de las bendiciones. So that we can receive the fullness of the blessings que se nos ha prometido y para ser realmente eficaces. To receive uh, of the blessings that have been promised to us and, uh, and make them real in our lives. En nuestro llamamiento hace falta que logremos la conversión. And in our callings, we need to obtain this personal conversion. Si estuviéramos realmente convertidos de corazón, haríamos todo el esfuerzo posible. If we were truly converted in our hearts, we would do everything possible. Por guardar un convenio o un mandamiento. To, to keep a covenant and a commandment. Por cumplir una asignación. To complete an assignment. Y por seguir a Cristo. And to follow the Savior. En Doctrina Convenio, convenio leeremos 107.99. In Doctrine and Covenants 107.99, we read. Aprenda todo varón su deber. Every uh, person learn their duty. Así como obrar con toda diligencia. And working with all diligence. En el oficio al cual fuere nom fuera in, nombrado. In which you are called. 
La persona verdadera convertida ha de luchar continuamente por superar sus debilidades. The truly converted person needs to continue constantly to fight interiores y no solo ocuparse de la apariencia externa. To overcome their uh, weak, interior weaknesses and not worry about the outward appearance. Yo tengo un testimonio de I, la iglesia. I have a testimony of the gospel. Que es verdadera. That is true. Que Jesucristo vive. That Christ lives. Le doy gracias a mi Padre y a Celestial y a Jesucristo. I give por, thanks to my Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. Por haber conocido en su momento a esos maravillosos misioneros que hoy en día tenemos a nivel mundial. To have met the wonderful missionaries that we have worldwide. Y gracias a ello, poquito a poquito he aprendido del Evangelio. Y and I have learned little by little the gospel. Y hoy en día, mis hijas, mi familia, como dije anterior, están muy contentos de que yo sea miembro de and, la iglesia. And this day, my, my children and my family are very uh, thankful that I am a member of this church. Se me olvidaba mi esposa. And my wife. Que ahora en este momento no se encuentra aquí, está de visita en Valencia, España. But today she is in Valencia, Spain. Pero quiero saber que estoy muy contenta de haberla conocido. And I'm very happy to have met her. Gracias a este maravilloso web y repito al Evangelio de Jesucristo de los Santos los Últimos. Thanks to this gospel, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Y quiero ser también un buen discípulo. I want to be a good disciple. Del Padre Celestial of our Heavenly Father. Y esto lo dejo en el nombre de Jesucristo. Amen. En el nombre de Jesucristo. Amen. I was thrown off a little bit because when he was called to be a counselor in the bishopric uh, four or five years ago, he's only been a member seven years. Four or five years ago, he was called to be a counselor. And the first time he went to the pulpit in Spanish, his lang native language, his knees would not, st we truly had a knee fight. <laughs> yeah, the knees would not stop fighting. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Good morning. So as President Jensen said, I'm Ramona James. And for those of you who I haven't had the opportunity to meet, I'm from New Mexico, and I've been serving my mission for 16 months. And it has been the greatest decision that I've ever made to serve a mission. And honestly, to, to be able to experience the personal growth that you go through on a mission. And as I've thought about what I wanted to bear my testimony on today, I feel like I just need to stick to the basic principle that we have a loving Heavenly Father. And as a missionary, I have seen that in ways that I've never seen it before. And I just have such a strong testimony that we have a Heavenly Father who loves us, and because he loves us, he wants us to return to him. And because of that, he's given us things to help us in this life so that we can return to him. And some of those things are our savior. That's the biggest thing that he's given us is the sacrifice of his only son, Jesus Christ. And I know that, that the savior, he came to this earth and he lived a perfect life. That he set a perfect example for us and that he suffered for each and every one of us for our sins so that we can repent and change. But also, he experienced every single pain and heartache and every joy that we're ever gonna feel in this life so that we're never alone. And that brings me so much peace to know that I have a Heavenly Father who also loves me perfectly and knows me perfectly who was able to watch his only son suffer through that go through that hardship for each and every one of us. And I know that the only way that, that they were both able to do that is because they love us with a perfect love that we don't understand, that we can't possibly understand yet. And another thing that, that our Heavenly Father has given us because he loves us so much is this restored gospel of Jesus Christ. As we know, the gospel was lost after Christ and his disciples were killed. And there was a, a lot of darkness in the world for a long time. But our Heavenly Father had a plan. And Joseph Smith one day said a prayer and he received an answer from our Heavenly Father. 
And through the help of Jesus Christ, Joseph Smith restored this church to the earth with all of the, the correct principles and doctrines that our Savior taught during his life. And he didn't, he didn't just restore it without any, anything else. He also restored a book. He translated a book, really. He didn't restore it. He just translated it and brought it to pass. And that book is called the Book of Mormon. And I, I know that the Book of Mormon is an evidence of the restoration, an evidence that Joseph Smith was a true prophet, is a true prophet of God. And it, says, it has a promise from, our, from the prophet in the introduction to the Book of Mormon that says that a man will draw closer to God by reading the Book of Mormon and abiding by its precepts than by any other book. And that is true. As I have studied the Book of Mormon and applied those principles in my life as best as I can, I'm not perfect, but I do my best. I truly have strengthened my relationship with my Savior and with my Heavenly Father. And I know that that's something that that everyone has the opportunity to experience. And the last thing that I, I want to bear my testimony on is the gift that the Holy Ghost is in our lives. When Jesus Christ was on the earth, he taught us a perfect doctrine. And that was, it starts with faith. And we have faith in Jesus Christ. And because of our faith, we're going to have a desire to change. Because we're not perfect. And we're going to want to be more like him and follow his example. And we're going to recognize that we need to change. And so we were asked to repent and receive forgiveness for those mistakes that we make every day. And whenever we, we make that change, we're also asked to be baptized so that we can receive a complete remission of our sins. But then we get a really cool blessing that is the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost helps us to be able to continue on, which is the last step, to endure to the end. And the Holy Ghost bring, helps us to know all of these things that I have come to know are true. And, and it's the way that we can continue to learn more about our Heavenly Father. And to be able to receive the comfort that comes from our Savior. To know that Joseph Smith was a prophet. To be able to apply those principles, remember those principles from the Book of Mormon. In the moments that we most need them. And I just want to end my testimony with a scripture about the Holy Ghost. And it, it's in Moroni chapter 8, so it's in the Book of Mormon. And this verse, I have to find it really quick, sorry. It talks, about, it talks about the doctrine of Christ that I just talked about. Faith, repentance, baptism, Holy Ghost, and dirt to the end. But what it says about the Holy Ghost, I think, is so powerful. It says that because of the meekness and lowliness of heart cometh the visitation of the Holy Ghost, which comforter filleth with hope and perfect love. And that's so true. I, I just want to bear my testimony that, like I began, we have a loving Heavenly Father who has blessed us with a, a perfect doctrine, a perfect church, and that as we apply the, the teachings of this church in our lives, we will truly be able to become more like our Heavenly Father and our Savior, and one day we'll be able to be back with them. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.
we would, we've asked a few people to just share a, a testimony, but before we do that, I'd, um, as Brother Woodbury took care of in our ward business, or in our state business, uh, with the release of Brother Reed, uh, effective July 1, Ken. Um, I just want to share a few things. We've asked Ken and his good wife to share their testimonies. I just want, if you are getting released from a calling that you, it takes a calculator to kind of calculate the impact that you've had, then you know you've done something amazing. Um, Ken has served as the executive secretary. <clears throat> For 23 years, he was called by President Cook. He served President Schneider. He served President Shaw. He served President Young. And when I was called, as I left the stake office, he walked out to my car with me. He said, my job is to protect you and to take care of you. And I think I speak for President Cook, President Snyder, President Shaw, and President DeYoung, that he's done that for 23 years. He's protected us. He's looked out for us. He's offended a lot of you in the process, and I apologize for that. <laughs> But I, I, when I went home after my first week, my kids said, how's Ken? Because he's scared them in the past too, you know? <laughs> and I said, he's amazing. You know, he does such great things. So I just wanted to share some of the math figures that I've calculated. He's, he was first called into his stake position when he was 53, and now he's almost 79. If you think about that, that's 1,300 weeks. And if you do the math, because I think he's probably called every one of you multiple times. If he made 25 calls a week, that's over 32,000 calls. By telling you this, I'm ensuring that we will never find a replacement for him. <laughs> no one's ever going to want to step up to that plate. Um, I'm just kidding. We may have, have, have somebody that's willing to do it. Um, but it's a great commitment of time on both his part and his wife's. As I talked with him this week, he said, what am I going to do? This stake is, my whole life has been with the stake. He said, the only one that served there longer is President DeYoung. I better get with him and figure out what I do. So President DeYoung, wherever you are, you're going to have to, you've got some counseling to do. Um, I would also let Bishop Jarman know that after July 1, you have an amazing, servant of the Lord, coming back to your ward. And I'm sure you have a place for him because he has so much more to give. We would like to first hear from his good, dear wife. She's spent 1,300 Tuesday nights alone. And um, good luck, Julie, getting, dealing with Ken on Tuesday nights. <laughs> Just keep some trail mix and warm milk ready for him. He'll be good. Um, but we'll first hear from Julie, and we've, we've just got a, a small token of appreciation for her and for her support and the countless hours that she sat home alone while he was here. We'll then hear um, Ken. We'd like to hear from him share his testimony. Following Brother Reed, we've asked uh, President Schneider, Brett Schneider, to share his testimony. Um, following President Schneider's testimony, uh, we will hear from the, our, the second counselor in the temple presidency, President Jerry and Sister Kit Jensen. We'll hear from Sister Jensen first and then President Jensen um, second. And then 
uh, this President Jensen will have the opportunity to close the meeting. Um, we're not related. I'm sure you can tell that. He's much better looking. And um, once he speaks, you'll, be, you'll know that he's much more spiritual as well. So thanks for coming and setting a high standard. Um, we will then, uh, following my talk, with the state choir will sing uh, God is Love as our closing hymn, and then uh, the benediction will be offered by uh, Sister Rochelle Pierce of the Riverdale First Ward. Julie, we'll turn the time over to you. President, I want you to know that the bring back expiration date on Ken has expired. <laughs> I am grateful for Ken's service. I learned that he was very organized as a scared 19-year-old, and I was trying to navigate the registration process at college, which in those days we didn't have computerized. It was all done by paper. I had no idea to get through it. And this young little Lutheran boy that had been sent to Utah with the admonition from his mother there are Mormon girls be th there, be careful. <laughs> and the rest is history. He joined the church as a, as a college student and has been faithful in the gospel ever since. I am so grateful for his organizational skills. They have helped me a lot through my life. And I want to say to him, I want to say what Alma said at, in the Book of Mormon, Alma returned to his own home to rest from his labors. And also, Moroni retired to his own home that he might spend the remainder of his days in peace. So I don't know how Ken will do without his phone in his hand at every minute. A year ago, he had five bypass surgery on his heart. And as I came in the hospital one morning, he was laying in the bed. It hadn't been very many days since he'd had the surgery, and he had his phone up to his face like this. And so I knew that he was recovering, and it would be soon that he would be calling again. I have a testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. My fires of faith were born many years ago. On my father's side, I was brought the faith of the gospel through the Mormon pioneers that crossed the plains. And they came to the state of Utah and settled in Mount Pleasant and Heber City. And I am grateful for their hardship for the gospel and their testimony of the gospel. On my mother's side, my grandfather left his homeland to join the gospel in Utah and left his family, his mother and dad, never to be able to see them again in this life. But their testimony was so strong that it brought them here, and I'm so grateful for my fair forebearers. I was reading this week in the Book of Mormon about the prophet Benjamin, and when he got up on the tower, and immediately my mind had a different idea of this scripture than I'd ever had before. I could see President Nelson standing in, in the conference center talking to us. And I thought, that, that's interesting because uh, Benjamin, with King Benjamin was talking to the people and they had their tents facing him like we had our television sets facing him. And I have a testimony of a prophet on the earth today. This is the troubled world that we live in. It's not easy. There's things happening all the time. But I followed the prophet. I don't have to worry. I know the prophet knows the way. And I leave this testimony with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I'm on TV. <laughs> That's all right. I always thought when I was a youth, I was a good singer. And I was the lead singer in my seventh grade class in high school. My voice broke 
and I was kicked out. <laughs> <clears throat> How can I follow my wife, President Snyder, and um, President Jensen today? I tried to make uh, some notes about what I could say. I asked the president, he says he wanted me to bear my testimony, and I says, well, about what? And how much time do I have? And he assured me that I could take all the time I wanted and that he would, uh, uh, see, uh, give up all his time for tonight. <laughs> so last Tuesday night in stake presidency meeting, he issued my release, effective in July. Uh, I worried about that. First thing I asked him was, who's replacing me? And do I have to train him? Uh, it'll be a difficult job. The thing that came to my mind the most is, at that point and a few days later is, why are they releasing me? I, I, is there something wrong with my performance? And you can't use tenure as an excuse, I mean, I sat next to L. Tom Perry one day, and we were talking about tenure, and he explained it to me. He says, we need tenure in the callings of members in the church, especially elders quorum presidents. And I says, well, what are you talking about? And he says, tenure. And he spelled it for me because I'm not that bright. T-E-N-Y-E-A-R. You elders quorum presidents, look what you got to look forward to. You know, it's, it's unusual, but I don't know if you've all heard the story that if you get a calling in the church and the next thing you know, you like it, you're enjoying it, it's fun, and then what happens? They release you, call you to something else. Well, that's the way I felt about this job. I love it. It has been entertaining, it's been fun, it's been informative. It's helped my testimony grow. I love it. And somehow or other, I may manage to fly under the radar and not get called to something else. And I appreciate that. It's funny, but I've been driving over to this building for over 25 years. 25 some years ago, President Cook came to my house and called me to be the stake finance clerk. Finance? I can't even spell that. I didn't know what I was going to do. The only thing I knew about finances is that once a month my wife gave me my allowance and it was never enough. <laughs> it's, it's a strange world we live in. Uh, but a year and a half later, I was called to be the stake executive assistant secretary to replace a brother who had been called previously that had asked to be released after a short time because calling you folks for appointments and other things scared him to death. He was released and I took his place. A few months later, the stake executive secretary had the opportunity to become a bishop and I was alone for a few months. President Cook then called another brother to be an assistant. The first of three that I have served with over the years. They were great men. They made my life so easy. To do this job was so easy and fantastic. And I love them and I sure appreciate them. Brother Arrich was my first assistant, great guy. Gary Boatwright, who has since left the stake, was the second, and now I've been serving with Brian Christensen for this past 11 years that he's been with me. Fantastic guys, taken so much of the load off me as far as serving in the stake. I appreciate them, love them for it. I don't know how much longer Brian's gonna be there, but I told him he could have my job now, and he says, Talk to the president, there's no way I want that one. <laughs> well, it's, it's, been, it's been really fun to do this, but 
The, one of the biggest things about the joy of serving in this job has been you folks. You members, you good members of the church. There's so many, many wonderful people I've been able to meet, serve with, get to know over this past 23 years. That too has made my calling so, 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 so simple. And then there's the five stake presidents I served. Sometimes I'd like to claim six because I for a while had a stake job under President Hamlin, a fantastic man. But I can tell you now, and I can testify to the fact that all these stake presidents was called by the Lord to serve the stake, to serve us, to minister and administer to us. Great men, I love them all. True, I have my favorites. After all, I spent 18 years with President DeYoung, and that's a long time. He started out as second counselor, first counselor, and then he was president. That was a fantastic learning experience for me, and I love the man dearly. I have a special affinity for President Snyder. President DeYoung and President Snyder, I served for their full terms. Great guys, great men. I served President Snyder as a clerk while he was bishop. Getting to know the good people of this stake has been the most fantastic part of my life. I don't know what I'm going to do once I've left the stake, knowing so many good people. And I thank you heartily for the pleasure and the honor it's been to get to know you. Now, with five stake presidents, there was over 12 members of these presidencies over the years. They, too, were always great to work with. This new presidency, I've only served for about a year. But brothers and sisters, they're a hoot. <laughs> they're as lively as a bunch of Mexican jumping beans, I'll tell you. <laughs> Especially President Woodbury. With his knowledge and training in the gospel and in the church, he's been fantastic. And he's my favorite to listen to talk, too. <laughs> but I've asked myself repeatedly lately, why did they release me? And I think I figured it out this past week especially from a couple comments that President Woodbury has made. They, they weren't necessarily good remarks either. <laughs> you see, when we have state presidency meeting on Tuesday nights, they can go quite late. I've, we've gone as late as midnight with some of the past presidents. And President Jensen has made the effort to get us out on time, on time being 10.30, 11 o'clock. And I've always told them, hey, no problem, no sweat. I'm here to serve you. The time doesn't matter. And besides, I get to sleep in Wednesday mornings. <laughs> well, I think I finally got to them with my picking on them about them having to get up in the morning and go to work. Uh, well, OK, I'm leaving. But I have one more thing to say about that. I don't have to get up at 4 o'clock on Sunday mornings anymore. <laughs> they do. And they have to go to work early. Oh, my condolences. The thing about it is, I have approximately two and a half months now to continue to rub this in. But you know, they've been fantastic guys, good men, and I have enjoyed every minute serving them and working with them. I love them all. It's, it's been a fantastic experience. To the last 23 years, I don't know what happened there. There's some, something went wrong. The computer broke down or something. I don't know why it was. But I couldn't have possibly served this long or any of the other positions I've held without my good wife. Like my wife said, my mother warned me when I came to Utah 
the place is just littered with Mormon girls, and they're all weird. <laughs> so she admonished me to stay away from them. She even told me that Mormon girls have horns, and she actually believed that. And I finally wrote back to her one time and told her, I've dated several, and I can't find any horns. Her answer was, well, you know, being a farm boy, they cut them off. <laughs> okay, so Julie has been the most wonderful person I've ever met in my life. And over the years, I've failed to tell her how special she is, how great a wife she is. Nobody takes care of me better than she does. I love her dearly. She's the love of my life. She's also a lot smarter than me. So as our neighbor Mark Hansen stated last night during his talk at the adult session, we both married up. Only I married further up than he did. It's, it's been a pleasure to have her as, with me all this time. She's always walked beside me. Not once has she ever complained when I've been missing sacrament meeting with her or other meetings because I've been doing church business. She's been fantastic. There's no replacing her. She's either walked beside me all the time. Well, that's not true. She doesn't, hasn't walked beside me all the time. There's several times when she's walked behind me and pushed <laughs> and walked in front of me and pulled me. I couldn't and possibly think of anybody greater to love than her. And unfortunately, I don't tell her that enough. Brethren, take good care of your wives. They're so special. You know, the president asked me to bear my testimony. And I, when I told him I didn't know if I had enough time because I wanted to rattle on, I do have a testimony of the church. I know that my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ lives and stands at the head of this church at this day. I know that this is the true church upon the earth this day. The most fantastic thing to me was when I learned of the theology of the church, the blessings and the things that it promises us. As long as we hold to the path, hold to the rod, and obey the teachings and instructions that we receive from our Lord and Savior and from our Heavenly Father and from our good church leaders. I know that these brethren were called of God. I know that we are led by a prophet today and that I sustain fervently the leaders of the church every year, every opportunity I get. The First Presidency the 12 apostles, all as prophets, seers, and revelators. I know that this is what we should be doing in this day and age as we obey the teachings of our Lord and Savior. And I leave you there with this in the name of our Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I use a handheld, I might fall down, so I might just stay right here, President. All right. That's okay. <laughs> if you want to know what I'm doing up here using a walker, I would just say ditto from what Brother Hanson said last night. Thank you for your strength that you give, good brother. Sister Jean, as well, is my wife's the one that took me in to live wire. Anyway, I think they say married men live longer. I think I know why. I think Brother Reed has a little bit of the Apostle Peter in him. The Apostle Peter who left all that he had to follow the Savior. Who defended him in every way, even to the point of drawing the sword. Who when others were walking away because the Savior spoke of the bread of life, 
and tried to teach that he was central to the plan of salvation, but they didn't understand. When the Savior turned to the apostles and said, Will ye also walk away? It was Peter that said, Lord, thou hast the words of eternal life. To whom else shall we go? And so we had the privilege of moving into the second ward where the Reeds reside 45 years ago, and we've counted them as treasured friends and neighbors. As I thought about today and standing in this and perhaps uh, feeling like we've been in a COVID desert for 40 years, but we're all under the same roof. And my mind went to section 115 of the Doctrine and Covenants that tells us that Zion and her stakes are to be as a defense and a refuge from the storm. Do you feel that today? And do you get a sense that the church is in good hands? I appreciate the ability to sit side by side to, and to rub shoulders with each of you. And as we have locked arms at different times going through challenges, your response buoys me up. I'm grateful to our Father in heaven who is with us every step of the way and that he would allow his beloved son, the only begotten, even Jesus Christ, to act as a savior for us, to pay for a debt that he did not owe that would allow us to prepare to regain the presence of our Father in heaven. What a blessing it is. And I look forward to us hearing from President Sister Jensen from the temple. And I may I just say, it was uh, approximately six years ago now that Sue and I were called to serve in the temple. But what a blessing it is. It changes the trajectory of your whole family. And I think I could ask Sister Bardwell, as I know her grandfather serves there, what it's done for her family. It's real. I'm grateful for the blessings that the priesthood brings for the opportunity we have to be in a stake, to be surrounded by our leaders who are there to help us every step of the way. Brothers and sisters, I express my love to each one of you. Grateful to be numbered among you, and I do so in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Brother Snyder. It's been a pleasure to be here in your stake today. I can feel the love that you share among your members, and I, I know your stake president loves you very much, and, and we've been edified so far by the wonderful speakers. Um, we are here from the temple, and I just want to leave you my thoughts, just some quick thoughts about the temple, just the very word, the temple brings peace and love into my heart, and so... I just want to make you a promise that if you will attend the temple and come to the temple and do what President Nelson said, set an appointment and keep your appointments to be in the temple as often as you can, that when you leave the temple, you'll take the spirit of the temple with you. 
that your hearts will be changed and softened. You'll be more holy and kind and more loving. You'll be better able to resist temptation. You'll have a better relationship with your family and your friends. And you'll have more gratitude and love for the people that you serve on the other side of the veil. So come to the temple, brothers and sisters. I hope that you all love serving and worshiping and renewing your spiritual momentum and keeping moving forward on your journey, on your spiritual journey. I want you to know I have a testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I love our Savior, and I'm so grateful for him. And I'll say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, it's wonderful to be here, and I'll just say what she said. <laughs> it's perfect. Um, <clears throat> you know, this, this stake is a wonderful stake. We actually lived in this stake uh, way back when, and uh, while well, we were building our first house in Plain City, and uh, so we have, have tender, tender feelings towards this stake. We see many, many ordinance workers, several sealers uh, here in the audience, and uh, and we love your support for the temple. My by assignment is to invite you to the temple, just as Sister Jensen did. So please come and feel the joy of the temple. You know, as I think about this wonderful stake, Brother Schneider was a missionary companion of my brother in, in Australia. And uh, so we have ties there. Larry Hansen, your good patriarch, he and I ro frolicked the grounds of 16th Street in Ogden when we were one through four grades. So I've known Larry forever. And... Uh, Carl Cook and I grew up together in Plain City, and so I know a lot of people in your stake, and uh, it, it does feel like a little bit like home. So I'm going to just give you the heart of my talk here, because you need to hear your good stake president, and I wished he was my son. He looks a lot like my oldest son, so probably a little younger than my older son, but, <laughs> but anyway, we're, we're grateful to be here and to, to be with you. My, my talk today was on the joy of the temple. And it's from President Nelson's talk, uh, Joy and, and Spiritual Survival. And let me just talk to the heart of that. He, he mentions in, the, in his talk that man are that they might have joy. And he says, isn't it interesting that of all the words the Savior could have used as he was instructing Nephi, he chose the word joy to describe our existence here on earth. We're here to have joy. <clears throat> and then he goes on to tell how that joy was to come about. His last story in this article is about, uh, about the Savior. Let's see if I can find it right here, and we'll just talk about that. Um, he, ta he talks about Hebrews 12.2. Hebrews 12.2 says this, Looking upon Jesus as the author and finisher of our faith, now, this, is the, this really touched me when I read this for the first time. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. I find that amazing that Jesus Christ made it through this excruciating pain by focusing on joy. So this Sunday, as you ask yourself, what was the joy that was set before Jesus Christ on the cross? It was the joy of cleansing us, of healing us, of paying for our sins, for helping us to return home. I bear testimony that if you come to the temple and get to know the Savior of the world and his atonement, you will find this joy that President Nelson was talking about. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, President. Oh, thank you, President Snyder and, and the Reeds. What, um, what great testimonies. Really, what a great meeting we've had today with, with all the speakers, uh, their preparation and the spirit that they brought with them. We're, we're so grateful for that. I would just like to close. I know as a kid, I couldn't tell you really what was ever said at state conference, but I could tell you if it went over or if I got out early. And um, I remember the ones that got out early a lot better than the ones that got out late. So I know the, there's a, the clock is ticking. Um, as I think about the temple, I'll just touch on that real quick. Uh, about a year ago, as we looked as a stake presidency, there were over 800 uh, people in our stake that had recommends that were expired or, or not active. And uh, I know 
one of the things that we talked about early on was with our bishops to say, hey, there's a lot of people because of COVID, they haven't really attended the temple like they would normally attend. A lot of them haven't been able to get in and get a recommend. And uh, let's, we really would like you to focus on that. And we're, we're so grateful for so many of you who have um, come in and have gotten your recommend and who have, have renewed that and have been able to attend the temple. We're so grateful that uh, essentially uh, the temples are, are wide open and we would encourage you to go and to participate in the blessings that go there. Um, a year ago, um, like I said, we were over 800 and, and now uh, we're just over 600. So there's still some more room for improvement. Um, but there is, there is a great spirit in the temple. And as we talk about spiritual momentum, uh, I think for most of us, uh, there's no greater place to go to renew that momentum and to get things moving than to be able to go to the temple. And so whatever your situation is, I would encourage you to, to get a recommend, to keep your recommend, and then to use your recommend and, uh, and use it often because there will be great blessings that come into your life and it will increase your spiritual momentum. I've thought about what I could say today as we knowing that we had talked about spiritual momentum and the, I think the real question is is why really what does that momentum lead to we've talked about staying on the covenant path we've talked about you know doing good but why why do we do that the real reason is so that we can become like our father in heaven like his son Jesus Christ so that we can develop those same attributes that the savior had really so that we can sanctify ourselves. If you look up what the term sanctify means, it means to be pure. It means to be clean. It means to have love of the Savior. Are we doing things that would sanctify us? This last week, as I mentioned last night, I, um, we've had a, a cancer diagnosis in our family, and it's provided an opportunity for our family to be the beneficiaries our extended family, of so much of your love and service. Much of that comes from the, the Fifth Ward. It comes in the form of an elders' quorum president making a visit to the hospital, of a Relief Society president sending a text to see how people are doing, of a ministering couple mowing my mother-in-law's yard, bringing in dinner, of a, somebody that works at Medicaid, who, you know, it's a rare day if somebody in the government's gonna call you back, but they called back and said, how is your mom doing? And um, that, we thought that was probably a miracle in itself. I'm sorry if you work for the government. Um, um, but there's just been, it's a, it's a family taking our son with them. <laughs> Making sure he has a place to go. It's a doctor showing compassion. It's a nurse, one of the Hilton daughters that are in our stake, allowing like 40 people into a room that should probably only have about four. There's lots of different ways that we can show that we can serve others, that we can show compassion. Lots of different ways that we can develop Christ-like attributes. I would like to, in just a few minutes that we have, um, if I can see, I would like to just touch on a few things. If we read in Peter, uh, actually in Second Peter, he talks a little bit about why we do these things and how we, the things that we need to do to sanctify ourselves. And I would just read, it's in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. It says, whereby, and this is, starts in verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Where do we hear about divine nature? We hear it in the young women's theme, don't we? That's one of the first things that, that they say each week, is it? There's divine nature. What is divine nature? How do we evidence divine nature in each one of our lives? 
without going into all of the details on it, but if we continue to read in verse 5, it says, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. So one of the things of a divine nature is to have faith. The other is to have virtue. What does it mean to have virtue? It means that our thoughts are pure. We talked about that last night, how important it is to repent and to do those things that bring us closer to our Father in heaven so that our thoughts are pure, that we don't have that friction in our lives that takes us off the covenant path, that we repent, that we stay away from things that, that we shouldn't watch on TV or listen to or watch on our phone, but that we do things that are virtuous. In D&C 121, 45, we learned that we should let virtue garnish our thoughts unceasingly. Do you have virtuous thoughts? Is virtue garnishing thy thoughts unceasingly? There are great blessings that come to us if we do that. Most importantly, that the Holy Ghost would be our constant companion. What a great blessing that would be if we knew that we had the Holy Ghost as our constant companion throughout our life because we were living a virtuous life. I would encourage you to look at your own life and are you being virtuous? The next thing would be in the, from Peter's discourse is knowledge. What are you doing to increase your knowledge? Not only in the gospel, but of good books as it talks about in D&C. Are you reading? Are you spending your time bettering yourself or just scrolling through other people's Hawaii vacation pictures? Um, I would encourage you to not only have a, a plan to read the scriptures, but also to improve yourself in other ways. Perhaps it's going to the temple, it's reading, it's whatever it might be, but we need to be doing things that increase our knowledge so that we can become like our Father in heaven. The next two are temperance and patience. These are probably ones that I think I struggle with the most. It has to do with self-control and being patient. Uh, my wife will probably testify of that. Um, interestingly, I, was, I thought it was so interesting. The other night, I was actually going to a little training meeting. So I was trying to get maybe more spiritual than I was at work that day. And as I hit the roundabout right here on 700, a car didn't stop and kind of ran me into the middle of the roundabout. And the natural man would normally have taken over. Um, and it didn't. I was like, wow, I just... I'm making an improvement. Um, and I, I was so proud of myself. And I, uh, I just sat in the car and I thought, you know, I didn't wave at them. I didn't yell at them. You know, I, I just, I was happy that they ran me off the road. Um, <laughs> but I think there's, there is improvement that we can all make, uh, whether it's in our own homes, with our coworkers, with our spouse, with our kids. We can be more patient. We can show more self-control. If we do that, those are attributes that the Savior had, and we will, we will become closer to him. Finally, um, the last two that I just touch on is the importance of being kind. Are you kind? Do you know who your neighbors are? Do they know that you're a member of the church? If they saw you at Costco, would they dare to come up and say hi to you? Uh, are you kind? And if you're not, be kind. We need more kindness in the world. The final attribute that I think is, is probably the most important one, and that is, do we have charity? We know that charity is the pure love of Christ, and that he who has that at the end, will be, it'll be well with him. Are you charitable? Do you find ways to serve others and to love them? Do you see them? Do you see other people? as a savior would see them? Or are you harsh and critical with them? We need to be more charitable. We need to see people as the savior would see them. We need to see them as the missionaries see them with great potential. Be charitable and it will be well with you at the last day. Finally, I would just give you an invitation today.
to think about where you stand as you read through the scriptures in Peter in uh, the first chapter. See how you are coming along with your divine nature. Are there areas that you could improve on? And if there are, I would encourage you to maybe write those down. Say, these are three things that I'm going to do better. I'm going to work on these right now. I am going to be virtuous. I'm going to get to know my neighbor. I'm going to be charitable. I'm not going to yell at my kids. Whatever it might be, so that you begin to have a really just a life of growing closer to the Savior. In 3 Nephi, and I'll just I'll end with this. In 3 Nephi uh, 27, 27, it's a scripture that we've shared a lot, but it, and it's one that you're familiar with, but at the end of that it says, Therefore, what manner of men ought ye to be? Verily I say unto you, even as I am. At some point, our hope, the reason... we're developing spiritual momentum is so that when we're asked that question when the Savior asks us and says what manner of men or women are you you can say I am just like you. I have developed the same attributes. I am just like you. And that is why we're developing spiritual momentum. I would hope today that as you leave here, that you have a renewed commitment to developing your spiritual momentum, to developing those attributes that draw you closer to the Savior so that when you are asked, you can say, I am just like you. Let me come in. I know that the church is true. I love my family. I got told last night I never say that. I love my family. Um, I appreciate my good wife. She's really the best of the best. When you talk about these attributes, she has them. She can answer that question. I love her dearly, and I'm thankful that she's letting me work on my patience and my temperance and then kind of correcting me along the way in her gentle way uh, most of the time. I love the gospel. I love each one of you. I know that our Heavenly Father loves us and is aware of each one of us. He knows what each one of us is battling, and a lot of the things that we're dealing with do require us to battle. I think that's one of the things that's been the most apparent to me as we talk about sin or temptation, it is a battle and it requires effort as we've talked about last night. Give it your effort. Give it your all to become more like the Savior. And I say these things and do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this day. We thank thee for the opportunity that we have to gather together and um, be together as a stake and hear the words that were spoken today. And we're thankful for the message, the messages that were given and the spirit that was felt. And um, please bless that we can take the messages that were given and that we can um, use them as spiritual momentum and that we can um, have thy spirit throughout the week and please bless that we can um, always strive to be more like our Savior Jesus Christ and bless that we can follow his example. Please bless that we can um, think of others and always strive to be kind and find opportunities to serve others and um, be better disciples of our Savior. And please bless those that are sick and afflicted that um, they can feel thy love and that we can find ways to help them. And um, Please be with us and help us. Um, throughout our days and bless that we can always strive to be more like thee and we say these things humbly in the name of thy son Jesus Christ, amen.